David Corman, you are a science writer, so you deal with uh, science communication. In your opinion, what's the role of communication uh, in all these aspects when dealing, uh, when facing an infectious disease outbreak? Well, people become scared when they face an infectious disease outbreak, particularly now with Ebola. They're confused, they're bewildered, and they need explanation. So I think the role of the science communicator is to give them clear and accurate and rational information so that they know what they should be scared of and how scared they should be and not be too scared about the wrong things. And in other words, it helps them separate proper reaction from overreaction or underreaction in terms of their own behavior and their levels of concern. Ebola has raised a, a huge wave of panic, uh, especially in the Western world. And, uh, but however, for instance, in Africa, there are diseases that kill much more than Ebola, like uh, malaria, for instance, uh, or uh, a few months before uh, the, the Ebola outbreak started, we had uh, some cases of, of a new SARS in the uh, Middle East. Yes. But right now, these two diseases seem to, be, to have disappeared from the, the public attention. Why Ebola raised so much panic? Well, let me, let me change the word. I don't think people are panicking about Ebola. I think they're very scared and they're bewildered. But panic to me suggests that people are acting irrationally. And I hope we haven't come to that yet. They want to know how to act and we're trying to help them understand. So there's a great deal of fear and confusion about Ebola now, partly because it has a very high rate of lethality. It kills about 50% of the people that it infects and that's very scary. Only rabies and a few other viruses kill higher percentages of the people they infect. Also, people have the idea that Ebola is very bloody and gruesome. It causes people to bleed out. It causes their organs to liquefy. And that's not true. That's not true. It's a myth. Um, it's a misunderstanding that has been perpetrated about Ebola. In some cases, people bleed. In many cases, there is no particular bleeding. And Ebola does not cause people to melt down. That's, that's, that's rumor and confusion. But it has caused greater fear about the virus. It's a horrible virus, but it doesn't do mysterious things. And I think the third reason people are scared of Ebola is because it comes from the African forest. And people are, most people are only dimly aware of the African forest. It seems a, a scary and mysterious place. I spend a lot of time in the African forest and spent a lot of time there while I was researching this book. The African forests, the equatorial forests of Central Africa are beautiful places that happen to contain some dangerous viruses. Um, so part of what I'm trying to, to do with this book, Spillover, is to eliminate the irrational fears and simply explain the dangers of Ebola in rational terms. As you said, Ebola um, what comes from uh, West Africa, and uh, West Africa, in Africa in general, is perceived as a mysterious country. The new SARS we, we, uh, we talked about before comes from the uh, Middle East, or at least it firstly appeared in the Middle East. So is there a risk of discrimination towards people that comes from Africa, from the uh, Middle East? and? How, uh, how it could be possible to face that kind of discrimination and uh, stigmatization? Yeah, well, this is a very difficult question. It's a social question, certainly. It's not a scientific question. Uh, these viruses tend to emerge from the tropics, tropical countries, uh, but that includes tropical Southeast Asia, uh, as well as tropical Africa. Some of them come from tropical South America. Um, far away places that, uh, that contain people who look just a little di different from the way we look in Europe and in, the, in America. Um, 
and we shouldn't stigmatize those people. I mean, obviously people in America look every, we have every kind of person in America, but, but the idea of someone coming from West Africa is, um, is now starting to be used as a reason for suspicion and exclusion, and that's very wrong. I saw a picture of a woman in, I think, the New York Times, a Liberian woman holding a sign saying, I am a Liberian, I am not a virus. And we have to remember that people are all around the world, Africans and people in Southeast Asia and, and everywhere, are just people like us, and I know this from having spent time in Africa, the people in the villages of West Africa and Central Africa are just people like us, and they're scared of viruses and they need health care, so we have to treat them as, as human beings first of all. Um, and then how we control the potential spread of the virus, again, we get into these very complicated issues of civil liberties as well as public health. Epidemiology is a scientific dis the discipline that studies uh, virus, bacteria, uh, pathogens in general. Since, especially right now in the internet age, since panic and fear can spread all over the internet quickly, do you think that we should also need an epidemiology of panic in order to better face this, uh, this disease? Yes, that's a good point. Um, there is a man in Uganda, a wonderful doctor named Dr. Sam Okwari, and he was head of the Ebola task force in Uganda at the time, and I think it was 2007 or 2008, that they had an Ebola outbreak there. And soon after the outbreak, I went to see him. And Dr. Sam was telling me about what happened with their Ebola outbreak. Uh, there was an epidemic, it was, it was almost an epidemic, and he was saying, you know, it came from animals and it got into people and it spread from one village to another and people were dying. And then Dr. Sam said to me, there was a second epidemic. And the second epidemic was fear. And people became irrational and they ostracized their neighbors. They wouldn't take their money. They wouldn't sell food to them. They, they banned them from the villages. And this was irrational. This was fear. This was, this was genuine panic. And it, it made it more difficult to deal with Ebola. So we have to understand that. We have to understand the level, the dimension of irrational fears and panic. And yes, there should be an epidemiology of fear and panic so that we can understand how to control that with clearer information and explanation and transparency of our institutions, uh, as well as controlling the, the epidemic of the virus itself. One aspect that really emerged from your, from your book, Spillover, is that there are a, really a lot of things that we don't know about pathogens, especially when they come up for the first time at our attention, at least. So uncertainty is a main part of, of what we should communicate. But it's, it's not easy to say, I don't know, or I'm not really sure. So in your opinion, how uh, it would be possible to deal with that? Well, most people don't realize that science is provisional. Science is a process. Science is not just a body of answers. In my book, I try and portray science as a process, as provisional. These very courageous and very smart, tough people, men and women, are in the forests, are in the cities, are tracking these diseases, being the disease detectives, and trying to solve the mysteries of Ebola and these other diseases. And in a lot of cases, they don't yet have the crucial answers, or they don't have all of the answers, but they're working on it. And maybe an answer that they have this year will turn out to be wrong next year, or will require modification. That's science. That's the way it works trying to improve itself in the body of information all of the time. And again, I try, I try and write about the process of science and the people who do science, as well as writing about the subject of science, the diseases themselves, the ecology of viruses. So I hope with the stories that I present in this book, there are a lot of human stories, mystery stories of scientists doing their job, trying to solve mysteries. I hope that will help people also understand not just the problem of viruses, but the process by which science helps us understand the world better. Again, speaking about uh, Ebola, 
you said, uh, you wrote, that there are many aspects that made this uh, outbreak particularly dangerous, more than the previous ones. And some of these aspects are, for instance, the low level of health systems in the, in the countries that have been hit by the, by the disease, or uh, the, well, the poverty, the distrust toward the government or towards uh, Western medicines. After 30 years of civil wars and upheavals. So, can we say that the disease is not only caused by pathogens? It's not only, well, the, the epidemic is not just a reflection of the dangerousness of Ebola in this case. The epidemic in West Africa is also a ref reflection of the social conditions and the economic conditions there. Yes, this outbreak would not have spread to being an epidemic if not for those conditions that made things worse, as you mentioned. Uh, crippled governance after 30 years of civil wars and upheavals. Poverty, very little money to spend on healthcare infrastructure, very little in terms of medical supplies and expertise. Crowded cities with crowded neighborhoods of poor people living in very dense conditions. All of these things have contributed to, um, to this epidemic getting out of control. And so part of what we should realize is not just that Ebola is a very dangerous disease, but that the world cannot afford to let people live in poverty with bad health care like that. It's not just bad for them. It's not just wrong. It's bad for everybody. It's bad for global public health to allow people to live in situations close to the forest or jammed together in cities in which their, um, their health care systems and their level of sustenance, their food, um, makes them very vulnerable to diseases because then those diseases can, can potentially spread to the rest of the world. One very last question. We know that pathogens, especially viruses, can evolve sometimes very quickly and this makes them uh, much more uh, difficult to fight. In your opinion, our uh, current knowledge about the theory of evolution, about these mechanisms uh, and so on, do you think that all this knowledge uh, is helpful to try to understand, maybe even predict some directions of the virus's evolution or in any case to help us to, to try to fight them in a better way, in a more effective way? That's absolutely right. If you don't believe in evolution, then you may, not, may as well not worry about emerging viruses. Um, I saw someone on Twitter um, just last night said that um, it seems that the conservatives who are so worried that Ebola might become airborne don't realize that that implies they now believe in evolution. It's all about evolution. Ebola is not likely to become airborne because it would have to evolve too far. A giraffe is not likely to fly because it would have to evolve too far. But we know that Ebola is mutating. Mutation is random. Adaptation requires the process of Darwinian natural selection to shape the way evolution occurs. But it's, it's possible for all of these viruses to evolve and adapt better to being pathogens of humans and um, and we need to understand that we need to understand Darwinian evolution in order to understand why these viruses are so dangerous thank you very much You're very welcome